What's up, YouTube? We back again. Another reaction. Airplay Beats, La and Chi. And today we got part two of the making of Asia. You ready? Yep. Here we go. This is the day of the expanding man. <laughs> Love that boy. Man. That shape is my shame. Then where I used to stand. It seems like only yesterday I gazed through the glass at ramblers, wild gamblers. That's all in the past. You call me a fool. You say it's a crazy. That wasn't in your top five, right? <laughs> it was six. It was six. So useless to ask me why. Throw a kiss and say goodbye. I'll make it this time. I'm ready to cross that line. Learn to work the saxophone. I play just what. hearing one of them. This was this when I was singing with like Jerry Lewis. Remember that? Yeah. What can you do? That was a very fertile period for you. Let me take these out of solo now. This is amazing. <laughs> well, uh, Deacon Blues is a great track. They've always had an affection for these kind of uh, faded hipsters. But I think Deacon Blues uh, takes that affection to an almost philosophical level. It's become a, a you know, it brings a, a nobility to that kind of faded hipster uh, attitude, which I think has you know, very deep roots in their own personalities. You know, they were both uh, young kids, most influenced really by bohemian beatnik attitudes of the late 50s and early 60s. Here's our electric guitar over here, Larry Carlton. Tasty. Yeah. Larry uh, played live on a lot of these dates, and he had a, uh, he was very good on rhythm dates at really holding, uh, holding, uh, being a core uh, pulse for tunes and holding them from uh, moving around too much rhythmically. And he had usually uh, done the charts on tunes that he was playing on. I, I think of myself as the person that they wanted to be the liaison between themselves and the studio musicians. They would give me their demo tape, and it had those wonderful piano parts on it. And many of the bass parts were on there also. And I would be the person that would take those notes off of the tape, fill in the blanks where they weren't sure of what they wanted to be played, and then I would take that, that chart to the session, and I would be the person who was familiar with the song out in the studio with the studio musicians. Mm, so if Donald or Walter would say, Larry, we're, when we go to the bridge at the such and such, I would be able to tell the musicians that's bar 19, B flat seventh with a raised nine. He had the inside scoop. Because he did his homework. Well, no, they gave it to him, I think, a little earlier is what it sounded like. Well, I thought they gave it to, uh, well, I took it as they gave it to a few people, but yeah, he's he, the only one that really, really did his homework. Yeah, right. And he and he was able to, and it sounded like he wrote something to it. He added He didn't little, just play, he no, wrote. He, he got yeah, the, he oh, actually got the skeleton, wrote. skeleton, and then he yeah. put it, did his thing on it. And did and listened to it so much, he was like, well, there's nothing here. Let me put something here. Let me put something there. I want to be he part wanted of that something job. like this. He wanted that job. Hell yeah. Got it. And it's a it's a master chorus. He's hitting on there though with those those chords on Deacon Blues. The, it's crazy. It, the chords on Deacon Blues, like it actually the guitar chords and notes actually take you it takes you it takes to a you. place. Yeah. The steely, I can't even describe steely it. land. That's where it takes you every time. 
Oh. Tell the musicians that's bar 19, B flat 7 with a raised 9. He knew bar 19, he knew the bars. You know what I'm saying? He did his homework, yeah. Six. This is, it's gotta be a You can sort of hear the, the bass uh, is just sort of floating along. You know, I was overdubbing over a, an existing track. Usually the bass player has to work a little harder to drive the uh, the track, but it was already there and for some reason. I kind of like the idea of just floating along here in the verse. And then here it goes to sort of a more conventional. Now, later we added. Uh, beat. We added a acoustic guitar. Acoustic is in there. In parts. Yeah. It's nice. That sounds good under there. Oh, man. One interesting thing about Donald and Walter I didn't is realize that, that perfection uh, is not what they're after. They're, oh. they're, they're after something that you want to listen to over and over again. So we would work then past the perfection point until it became natural, until it sounded almost improvised in a way so it was like a two-step process one was to get to perfection and then the others to get beyond it and to loosen it's it up a little bit loose. so that wow. it didn't have to be the perfect squeaky clean goal it is quite an amalgamation that's for sure and it's uh, interesting to note that uh, it can be a hit was it a hit I don't remember what the sub said. It was like when we did the Deacon video. Blues is about as close to autobiography as, as our tunes get. You know, we were both kids who grew up in the suburbs. Uh, we both felt, you know, fairly alienated. But like a lot of uh, uh, kids in the 50s, wow. we were looking for some kind of alternative culture, some kind of uh, escape, really, mm -hmm. from, from uh, where we found ourselves. And I think Deacon Blues is a nice kind of mm. example of, of that. He explained that perfectly. The, uh, that the protagonist is not a musician. <clears throat> he just sort of imagines that that would be one of the um, mythic forms of loserdom to which he might aspire. And, um, you know, who's to say that he's not right? A thing like that. a synthesizer pad on here somewhere. Yeah, this what the thing hell here. is that all about? Let's see. Go roll back a second, Rod. Oh, there, oh, there it is. <laughs> it's got <laughs> department store. That's what I'm thinking of. It's yeah. like that bing, bing I here. Okay. It's like, you know, what's the big toy store on 59th Street? F.A.O. Schwartz. F.A.O. Schwartz. It's like, you know, they play that same song over and over. It's New York, right. it's New York yeah. The kids like it because it's, it's like such primary, a Christmassy. It's the equivalent of an audio equivalent of a primary color kind of thing, you know? It's kind of a pheromone for tots. You bring them in and... We put that in. Why did we put that in there? Because, you know why? To fatten I think the maybe horns? the flute, there was a flute part on the top and ah, we needed trumpets that didn't cut. We wanted to cut. So I wanted to put a little high end on to the... To brighten and uh, clarify. Right, so then well, here's it is without the synthesizer. It goes like this. Or maybe we couldn't find a flute player or something. Oh, okay, now let's man. play it again and I'll this put this... It sounds so much louder. It's sort of a flute simulation, really. Or uh, yeah. it's marked here as a celeste, so maybe we were thinking of it for some reason as though it were like a uh, bells or something going along with that thing. Although it doesn't sound the least bit like a celeste. <laughs> I was always amazed that they pretty much heard in their heads what it was going to be like completed. So they knew right away when you get a bunch of musicians together and they're cutting the tracks and Donald Walter would be sitting in the control room going, no, this is not it, it's not going to happen. So maybe we'll try this other tune with these guys. Then they get another band in to, uh, to try the tunes that, that didn't work out. And uh, all through the project, uh, they would know, oh, nope, that's not it, that's not working, um, this is what I want. And uh, it was amazing that when the thing got done, finally I could see what everything was going to be like. Um, but they knew from the, from the very beginning. Wait, he said... <clears throat> uh, one band would be in there. He say that that's not it. Off top. Let, let's try a different song with this group. Off top. If that didn't work, they got another one waiting to try with that group of people. 
And then until that group of people hit one, they got one. Then you bring some other people back in to try them other two. I mean, that's master that's production. Dope. That's master production. Them brothers are producers. Yeah, that's they're, master they're way That's why I said that's master production. Tier producers. And they had a budget, too, because you're bringing people in. Yeah, that's a budget for sure. They bro. had a nice budget. Cause, for sure. Because you're bringing people in, taking people out. There had to be a fat budget. But they didn't tour or nothing, so. I'm talking about, you got to pay for the studio producers. <coughs> Studio instrumentals, yeah, yeah, yeah gotta, but, And if you're not using it, you're you, you, you're wasting money, kind of like, yeah, yeah. No one does this today, like, nah. That's bring what I'm in saying. several I would love bands to, be to part of something. You might be get on this track, but not this one, not that. But the, but the, like we said, they're music nerds from the beginning, and the stuff they're saying is like so. Like Becker doesn't smile. He doesn't. He's all business. It's all. Why did they break up? I forgot. Is there a reason? I'm sure they'll tell us after you ask okay. that one. Yeah, Let yeah, us know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I play just what I feel. It's beautiful. Oh, Hold on. I play just what I feel. It's beautiful. Oh, basic yeah. gospel. No emotion he shows. Yeah, it was beautiful. Response type of thing. We'll put in the lead and we'll see. The in the world. I, I wow. Wow. This is my number one today, Deacon Blues. Today on this, <laughs> today. It can switch up on you fast. Part of the reason I was driven towards jazz was when the radio stopped playing Chuck Berry and Little, Little Richard, uh, and this is when I was quite young, but I still noticed that, that something was wrong with the music after a while when they started playing white singers, singers like um, Frankie, Avalon and uh, and uh, that kind of thing. I like black music, essentially, whether it be R&B or gospel or jazz, you know. He said when My they started putting Frankie Avalon in the them on, I was, I was done. Said, when she was a little girl. She used to do it in the summers till, till she was a teenager. And she used to sing around the house, so so I'm familiar with the, the uh, repertoire, you know. Both Walter and I have a background that includes songwriting from the 20s, 30s, and 40s, and 50s, mm -hmm. mostly in jazz versions. Wow. Yeah, I mean, there are people who've read books, and there's people who ain't read books. They've got a skill um, that can make images that aren't pure and don't make you think you've heard it before. Very Hollywood filmic, in a way. The imagery is very imaginable, in a visual sense. Uptown, baby. Uptown, baby. Hey, he knows Uptown, it. He knows baby. it. <laughs> oh, of course he does, because they had to get they had to get the sample clear. I didn't know he was gonna mention it. I didn't know he was gonna say that. I wasn't even gonna talk about it. Showing it. Yeah. Uptown, baby. Uptown, baby. This is amazing. I didn't know he was gonna bitch it. Hold on. He made a lot of money off that. In the corner. Yeah. Make my top five. <laughs> Damn, man. Well, it dope. starts out the guy's talking about this this girl he's, that he's involved with, and um, she's uh, sitting at a counter, and um, he describes her behavior and habits, and um, out of that you begin to see the, her character and uh, their relationship. We finally get a smile from Becker. He loves this one. He loves this one. Right here, this part right here. He's still smiling. This tune really does speak for itself in a way. Beat that big black cow. Was this in your top five? It's daunting for the top Black cow, uh, an ice cream soda. They used to, or, or, or we were, were confused about this actually. We, I thought it was a soda. They seem to be regional. They don't even know. Regional variations on the formula, but it's. They don't Root even beer know. and vanilla ice cream, or 
Something soft drink. Something like that. We were told by the oh, pause. Very big in the soda fountains. <laughs> we were told by the subs it was a liquor drink with vodka and something else mixed with. They don't even know. They don't even know what it is. It could be anything. That's crazy. Yeah. And they wrote the song by looking at a woman, a, 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 a man and a female together. Yeah. Excuse me, a man and a woman together. Uh-huh. Sitting in a... Sitting in, a, in their relationship. Yeah. Genius writing. But I tell you, that bass, the bass on this one always gets me. It, it does something to my soul. Doom, doom, doom. I can't wait to do And it. just... Uptown, he was like uptown baby, uptown baby. He was like uptown baby. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah that, that, that was the number one single for a yeah. minute. Like that. that's two hundred, two hundred. Like, this is amazing. Yes, it is. Like a gangster. Like a gangster. On the, on the run. You will stagger homeward to your precious one. Yeah. I'm the one. Man. Let's make everything right. Talk it out. Talk it out till daylight. Chorus. Mm-hmm. Walter and I both grew up in around in the New York area. Walter's originally from Westchester, and then I moved out to Queens. And, Westchester, but and went Queens. to school in Manhattan, and I'm from New Jersey, maybe. 20 minutes over the bridge, so uh, yeah, we both grew up in this area. I'm a soil man. They so New York. I think New soil. York life is what we most know about. There's a solo by Victor, a very good solo by Victor Feldman. Live on the tracking day. Are you gonna talk to talk, talk to him? If he's still here. answered an ad in the Village Boys and he said, did. you know, must have jazz chops, keyboard, no, keyboard, no hang-ups. Right. Keyboard, <laughs> keyboard, keyboard and bass player needed for working, working, um, you know, jazz Get, rock uh, combo. Something like that. You know, must have jazz chops. No hang-ups. No hang-ups. So we answered the ad and uh, we called and uh, we went out to Hicksville, Long Island, which for, for us was quite a haul, you know, because we never left Manhattan. We went out and we went in, in the basement, you know, it was like a kid with a ba- basement band, and uh, we liked some of the material. It was kind of early fusion type material. Before, did he say they put out an ad? He said they went to the basement. That's what I'm tripping about. No, 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 no. Did he say they put yeah. out an ad and then yeah. this guy responded and they went to visit him in, in the, the basement? They wasn't even in the studio. Well, no, they was. They had that, been well, that's his where his he was rehearsed probably. But anyway, just that's a different time of life. Just yeah, that's what I'm saying. Just put, putting ads out. That's a different time of life. Now, and you go visit him. He don't come visit you. You're going to the ba- He said he was in the basement, on, man. Now, if you're putting out an ad, it it's something. It's a whole different ball game. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 you you're selling now. something else now. That's something. That's, that, that's what a that's time. That's dope. What a time to be alive, wasn't it? Basement band, and uh, we liked some of the material. It was kind of early fusion type material before there was jazz fusion in a way. Hmm. You know, it's like when they're in the same room at the same time, uh, they're just like one no, person with Danny. two brains, you know. So the highbrow wow. intellectual humor, you know, you, you don't get any fart jokes or anything of the kind. <laughs> one person with no two fart They can usually finish no each other's jokes. sentences. Well, I first met them uh, when I put an ad in the Village Voice because I had a band and we were looking for a bass player and a piano player. And they answered the ad. So. They joined my band at first, and then, then one by one, we realized that, that there was deficiency in, in certain of the players that, uh, you know, uh, that wasn't quite up to this. You know, we started playing their songs right away, and uh, I immediately saw that these were great songs. If truth be told, we kind of took over his band. Uh, we kind of uh, That's erected amazing. towards the end of the first throwing out the old guys. He put out the ad. Sort of, you know, they joined his and ad. And that, in a way, was the core of the Steely Dan group. Later, because when we got a job out in L.A., we, we sent for Denny. He put the, the ad out. way around. He put the ad out for a band. 
and they joined him and took. He said we essentially took over his band. I see. Is that Purdy back there? Oh yeah, Asia's a great album. I'm glad you bought that for me. <laughs> it's like one of my favorites to play. When Tina cooking, she loves it. Hey, I bet. When we got to California, I don't know that we were nostalgic in, uh, in a general sort of way for uh, New York so much as we were nostalgic as writers for this uh, you know, milieu that we left behind. And we weren't finished writing songs with New York characters in, it, in them yet. So we kept doing that. And by the time we were finished, we had moved back to New York at which point we immediately started writing lyrics about California. <laughs> That's dope. That's a whole thing. That's dope, bro. He just explained what we have been going through the whole Steely Dan ride. To everything. We'd be like, we can tell they're in New York recording this. Yeah. We can tell they're in L.A. recording this. Like they so lit- after the first few albums, they went to New- back to L.A. But they make sure they you know back. where they're at. No, they when they got back to New York, they started writing about Cali, though. Right. But my thing is they they make sure they let you know, like you know what what where they, where they wrote that song is Genius. maybe recorded it there but they wrote that when they were out there they they like literally very smart guys they they're like um we we said that as far as producers man they they're like one of the best yeah, ever absolutely for sure absolutely <laughs> they're, they're, these this is blowing brother, my mind it, me like, too man they're like they're like they're, they're Dope producer. They're like 4.0 students. They they decided to do, like they didn't go into engineering or they are what I wanted to NASA. Be. They're they, what I wanted to be. Yeah. I, you don't have to tour. <laughs> you could just be the in the studio and just make some bangers. The, tour, the, the fact that they didn't tour was is that would be insane. beautiful. It, that's insane. What what that uh, that also says something else though. They were actually getting paid for their music, right? So they had they they own their masters. I'm sure they. Of course, they, not of course, because damn near ninety percent. Did you hear of no, him singing Uptown? Ninety percent of everybody else don't. Did you hear him singing Uptown, yeah. baby? Come on now, he was singing it for a reason. Oh, because he got a check. <laughs> yeah, he owns absolutely. everything. Absolutely. <laughs> Whoa. Forgot about, about that song. About being homesick, I think, for New York. I, I've noticed that, actually. I like how they switched the coast up I when guess, they uh, It's just uh, was our natural inclination to write these sort of stories, really. Home at last, the central metaphor was taken from Ulysses' big problem, you know, trying to get back home. But uh, we didn't take it that seriously. It's essentially just the idea of it. And if you write a little blues about Ulysses, you know. There's a guitar riff, sort of a Chicago blues sort of item. Larry Carlton. Chicago blues, though? He knows his stuff. Don Walter loves sophisticated harmony, but they're rock and roll guys. We're contemporaries as far as age, so we all were brought up listening to the 60s. And I know that they love rock and roll, but they also have a passion for harmony, which, as do I. All the players they use, we love great feeling rock and roll music, but we love harmony. Because they don't sound rock and roll. Not at all. But it's in there. When we did Pretzel Logic, which was the first album we did with uh, studio players, we had uh, done a couple of albums with our little band, and, and we had, you know, heard these players and done overdubs and stuff with them. And uh, but I found myself in the uh, in the room with these guys, and I thought, like, wow, I'm really outclassed here, you know. Aretha Franklin, Nina Simone, Roberta Flack, Donny Hathaway, James Brown, Lloyd Price. Ray Charles, Frank Sinatra, Got a Kooji Hines, Hines, and Ford, Barry Manilow, Dionne Warwick, The Animals, The Monkeys, The Beatles, B.B. King, Bobby Blue. Is he naming the people he played for? I 
guess. So now they already told me that they didn't want the shuffle. They didn't want the Motown. They didn't want the Chicago. <laughs> but they weren't it. sure how and what they wanted, but they did want halftime. Mm. I said, fine, then let me do the Purdy Shuffle. Ooh. And they said, well, what is that? I said, well, I'll show you where you can feel comfortable with it, and you'll end up getting exactly what you asked for. Halftime, funky, laid back, without thinking that it's a shuffle. And it goes something like this. Mercy. He did that. Let's isolate Bernard for a second because let's listen yeah. to that beat. Yeah, let's hear that. Bernard, you know, this isn't easy. That's you come drumming. in with a uh, that isn't easy. a tune that, and have sort of a something in mind, but uh, the way Bernard played stuff um, was always uh, he always had some unique stylistic thing that he did that uh, you would never imagine in advance and um, that nobody else would do. This tune was a good example of that. A lot of Bernard's hi-hat. His hi-hat game is... And this tune <laughs> particularly is a real driving kind of... Here's opening it too. You got the backbeat. You got double time. And you have it almost shuffled. Ooh, bee, bop, 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 Bernard, you know, it's, you know, it's a bad dude, right? This is the famous story where, where he you know, right come to there. a session, uh, at, you know, in the, in the early 60s, and he'd have two signs with him, and he'd set up these signs.